So in this video, I'm going to run through how to create a do-it-yourself hardware wallet using Sato Chip, an open source hardware wallet that runs on Java cards. So it's basically like an open source version of a tap signer or a tangent wallet. It's a great DIY option for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Sato Chip is really easy to set up. There is no hardware assembly required and flashing the software is very straightforward and can be done in about five minutes. Secondly, these Sato Chip cards are really affordable, especially if you're someone who's wanting to order multiple Java cards and make a couple of these devices either for yourself uh, or for family and friends. And the final reason why Sato Chip is a great DIY project is that it's one that allows you to have uncompromised physical security. These cards are both very secure and extremely discreet. Java cards are basically the same sort of thing. You find in your passports and credit cards and so on. There are multiple form factors. You know, everything from full-size cards down to something that looks like a SIM card, rings, implantables, everything. And one of the advantages that comes with this platform is it's basically secure by default, even if you forget to do things like lock down the cards themselves. So let's get into it. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe and that we can stay in the loop for content I make till you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. So like my other DIY videos, this is probably one where you want to look at the chapter markers and maybe jump around depending on what specifically you are after. I also put together a repository on my GitHub that brings together all of the different Sato chip projects as well as all of the documentation process that I'll be covering in this video. So first things first, we'll start with the simplest process possible. That's going to be a Java card and reader purchased from Sato chip and just using the official applets from their GitHub repository. All right, so we've got our fresh install of Windows. So first thing first, we'll open up our browser and I've just gone to my GitHub repository. Now, because we're just going with the stuff straight off the Sato chip web store, step one and two are done for us. We're just using the official ones. Next thing we'll do is get the cap file for the Java card. So I'll just click on there and basically this takes us down and on the page to the official releases. So this is just the official Sato chip GitHub for the Sato chip app. So we don't actually want the latest beta release, probably stick with the latest release. And we will just go down to assets and we want this cap file here. So we'll just right click on that and just say save link as. And we'll just stick that straight into our downloads folder. And from here, we now want to just go to flash the applets to the Java cards. So we are going to use a tool for this called Global Platform Pro. Just for the sake of simplicity and sticking closely to the official documentation, we will stick with downloading the uh, Global Platform file that is in the Sato chip repository for this demo. So we're on the official Sato chip applet GitHub. We will just go down to gp.exe. And what we want to do here is just click this little download raw file button here. Edge is warning us about it, but we will say keep. And that is downloaded. Now, one thing I'll quickly note here that's actually not included in the official documentation is that to use Global Platform Pro, you need a working installation of Java. Now, this will work with pretty much any version of Java. And if you already have Java installed, this will probably just work. But for the sake of this demo and to have the correct version of Java installed that I'll be using later, I'm actually gonna install OpenJDK version eight. I've actually got a link to the OpenJDK 8 release that we can get here on my GitHub page. And basically, I just want to download the Windows 64-bit JDK. I'll just download the MSI. All right, and once that has downloaded, we will just run the installer. And say next. Now, we do want to actually set Java home. And we'll also just set the Oracle registry keys. And we'll just say next and we'll say install. Finished. Okay, so once that is installed, what we're gonna do is we'll just go back to our instructions. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna open up the Windows command prompt. I'll just hit the Windows button, and if I just type in CMD, there we go, command prompt, that's the one we want. So we'll just say open, and I'll bring that over here. Now what I wanna do is firstly change the directory to my downloads folder, so I'll type in CD space downloads, and hit enter, and that takes the download folder. And if I type in DIR and hit enter, you can actually see that's the folder I was downloading things into. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say gp.exe, and then we'll put hyphen hyphen install. And now I'm gonna type in the name of the file that I wanna install. So in this instance, that is the file name just there. So I'll just type in sato, and if I hit tab, it'll actually auto complete that for me. And then I hit enter, and we're good to go. Oh, hang on a minute. I actually need to connect to the card. Okay, so we'll just put the card in. We can see the light's flashing and it's green, so we're ready to go. So now we've got the command up here and I'll hit enter. We can see it's flashing the card now. And there we go, that's it. So at this point, we now actually have a working SATO chip hardware wallet. 
So if I just open the latest version of Sparrow, which since 1.8 has supported the SATA chip, and we can see the SATA chip is there. Okay, so that was the easiest way to get up and going with SATA chip DIY. So it's time for something a bit more adventurous, and we're going to go down the rabbit hole of DIY even further and look at selecting our own hardware and building the software from source on your own PC. So I've just got an array of Java cards that I've had from various projects, uh, including some that I picked up for this video specifically. And basically the challenge here is just looking at this, it would not be obvious which ones do work and which ones don't. One of the challenges with Java cards is even though they look the same, their functionality can vary dramatically. I've actually included a list of Java cards on the GitHub that are tested and working. And for those who want to evaluate other potential Java cards and see whether they might work for this, I've also included a list of the actual features required. And the important thing to emphasize here is the card you probably want at the moment is the J3R180. This is actually the card you will get if you order one from SATA chip, and it's actually available both in the full-size card and as a SIM card form factor. Though the SIM card one does not support NFC, but either card is a great option to run SATA chip and a way that you can support SATA chip while you're at it if you buy the card through them. So next, let's look at some cards that I tested that will not work. Right out of the gate, these three cards here are actually not supported. They will not work with SATA chip. If you try and flash them to the card, you'll get an obscure error message like this, or like this. The second challenge here is sourcing good quality cards. Well, this card here actually should work, but I bought it from AliExpress and the vendor was not actually able to provide me with working keys to be able to use it. So it might have been like leftover stock or something like that. And you'll see it's giving us this error here as well as a warning saying that the command or keys we're using is invalid and will break our card if we keep going. So if you're trying out a new card and you get that message, you pretty much need to stop what you're doing, contact whoever you bought the card from and ask them what the keys are to be able to use the card. So I don't have the keys for this card. There's nothing I can do with that. It's a dud. So I'll get rid of that. These two cards directly from SATA chip are brilliant. They just worked exactly as you would expect. First try, no issues at all. So if you want a drama free experience and you want to support the project at the same time, getting these cards from SATA chip is definitely the best option. Now over here is the J3H145. We can see that is a card that is listed as testing and working. Uh, this card is cheaper than the J3R180, but it is also quite a bit slower. It's not the end of the world, but you will just notice a much slower user experience in terms of signing transactions, generating wallets and so on. This J3R180 is interesting. The funny thing about this one is it actually behaves differently to the J3R180s that I got from SATA chip. So basically this card here works just fine over NFC, but if connected, you know, into a hardwired interface actually doesn't work correctly. It's just a bit finicky. And finally, we have these three cards here. These three cards are all THD89 based cards. And basically what I've got here is the CodeWave NFC sticker tag micro edition, the Theta Key T101 and the Theta Key T104. SATA chip actually works great on all of these, though it does need to be tweaked slightly to be able to install and run correctly. These two cards here, NFC only, and are available on the CodeWave store. The challenge with this one here is it actually has a battery in it. Once that battery goes flat, the card is dead. This one here also has a nice big e-ink display on it, though it's important to say I have not coded this up yet, so the ink display doesn't actually do anything with SATA chip just yet. They don't actually list this device on the CodeWave store, but I contacted the distributor and was able to buy some samples. Now, the other thing I mentioned in terms of selecting a Java card to use is these different secure chips on these Java cards all have different security certifications for both the hardware itself and the operating system that is running on the Java card. So for example, these J3R180 cards are EAL6 certified on the hardware itself, as well as EAL6 Plus for the operating system running on the card. Whereas these THD89 based devices also have an EAL6 Plus certification for the card itself, but the actual Java operating system running on the cards is actually not certified. And the important thing to say with these security certifications is they don't actually tell you anything about the security of the applet you are running on the card itself, but rather they're something that should give you confidence in the underlying operating system and hardware that your applet is running on. So in terms of demonstrating building from source, I'll just be using this little key tag here just because it's so easy to be able to use very discreetly. You know, I've got a 3D printed little key tag here that you can just sort of slide it into. And you know, that looks like just any key fob. In terms of sourcing your own card reader, just about any smart card reader will do. Uh, these ones that SATA chip gives you can get on AliExpress for about three or four dollars. These Rocket Tet ones here are quite nice and they can take both full sized and SIM card sized cards and just connect over USB. They're also a memory card reader as well, which is also nice. These two cards I got here are chip only. These do not work over NFC. This is actually a dual interface reader I got from Thoth Trust, same one they're selling on the CodeWave store. It's quite nice and then it just has a USB cable built into it or can be just plugged in using a mini USB cable and it supports both the chip as well as NFC interface. And the one thing I will draw attention to is actually this NFC reader here. Is This here is an ACR122U. This card reader here is not actually safe to use for flashing these kinds of smart cards over NFC and it may actually brick them. 
So if you've got one of these lying around, it'll work just fine for operating the cards, but you don't want to be using it to flash them. One of the challenges with sourcing your own card readers is that these are the same sorts of card readers that people purchase to use with things like their defense IDs, government IDs, and so on. There was actually an issue a few years back where a vendor who was selling smart card readers was basically bundling malware with the drivers for these smart card readers that they were encouraging you to install to be able to use the reader. Any modern operating system, you know, Windows, Linux, whatever, you should not need to be installing any drivers. They should simply plug and play and just work. So because this little key tag I'm using is NFC only, I'll just be using the Thoth Trust reader. So we've selected our Java card, we've got our NFC reader, and now we're going to get our cap file. So we're not going to worry about the easy step. So we are going to build the actions themselves. So firstly, we need to recursively clone the repository. And the important thing I say here is if you click on code and just download zip, it will not work. You can use GitHub Desktop if you like, but we're going to be doing some stuff in the command line, so we might as well go straight there. So I'm just going to suggest that you install Git for Windows. So we'll just download that and install it with all the defaults. So once we have git install, we can just use this command here. We'll just go into our downloads folder and put it all there. We'll just right click to paste that command, hit enter. So once that has recursively cloned, we can just switch to the folder that it has newly created. So chip DIY and type in DIR, we can see all of the things we need in there. Now, the next thing we need to do is install Apache Ant. Now on Linux, this is an easy one-liner. On Windows, we can just download the binary distribution as a zip file here. And once that's done, we'll just open the folder and we'll just extract all and look, we'll just extract it straight into this folder for the moment. And once that's done, we're actually going to cut this folder from Apache Ant and just stick it straight on the C drive because that'll make the commands a bit easier uh, in a moment. And then to run Ant, assuming we've unzipped it to our C drive, we can then just run this command here. Though paying attention to the version you downloaded, this part of the path here has to match what you just extracted. So we'll copy that. We'll go into the folder that we recursively downloaded. We'll paste the path to ant.bat and we'll hit enter. And there we go, it has just built all the files. So now if we go into that SATO chip DIY folder, that's the one we pulled down with GitHub, you'll notice there's a new folder in there called build. In the, and in that folder, basically we have all of the cap files for all of the different SATO chip projects as well for both the official and THD89 builds. So if we want to install SATO chip, what we can do is just right click on that, just copy as path, go back over here to the command line and do the same command we did before. So basically now we'll just use the same command we did before because global platform is in this repository too gp.exe install. We'll just right click to paste the path to the built file that we copied just before. We'll make sure we put the card on the reader and then we'll hit go. Done. So just like before we can go to Sparrow, I'll just say connect hardware wallet and say scan. It's going to sit there and think about it for a second because these THD89 devices take a few extra seconds to initialize the very first time you use them. Oh, there it is, and we are good to go. So there we go, so we now have a working SATO chip in more of a sort of key tag form factor. Using source, we built ourselves. So the last thing I'll do is show you how to lock the cards themselves. Now the important thing to say when it comes to locking these Java cards is that unlike in my previous video with the uh, DIY Jade devices, if you skip the step of locking your card down, your funds are not actually at risk in that it's not actually possible to download either the Applets or the wallet data off a Java card even if it's unlocked. If you haven't locked the card, basically the most someone can do is query the card and find out which Applets are actually installed on there or they could do nasty stuff like delete the Applet, brick your card and so on. Fortunately, locking these cards is a straightforward process and it's also easy to unlock them in the future if you still have the keys. So locking these cards is really straightforward and pretty much all we need is a 32 character hexadecimal key that we will use to lock them. I'll just stick with the example on the GitHub repository. So for example, if I want to lock the card with this key here on Windows, I can just use that command and just paste it straight in to the terminal that I had before and hit enter. There we go. So now this card here is actually locked with those keys. And once you've locked the card like this, only people who have access to that key are able to do sort of management operations on the card itself. And just to be really clear, this key is not actually needed just for the normal operation of the card as a SATO chip hardware wallet. Uh, this key is only relevant to the management of the card. So things like listing applets, installing, uninstalling, and so on. Once the card is locked, all the commands to run operations on it are the same. You just need to specify the key uh, in an argument like this. And I can also just unlock it again just by using the unlock command. 
There we go. So the last thing I'll look at is a powerful feature of the Java card operating system. And that is the ability to have multiple applets on a single card that remains securely segregated from each other. And the great thing about this is it allows us to securely add additional functionality or security to our DIY hardware wallet. I actually included some applets that I think pair well with a DIY hardware wallet, uh, which are specifically Smart PGP uh, and a TOTP app. Download the relevant cap files. And basically we can then just install them with the same commands we used before. Basically now I can just open up Yubico Authenticator on a compatible phone, tap the tag there. There we go, I can see the tag. So now I can just add a test account. Basically I can just say save, tap my key again. And there we go. So now we have a TOTP token as well as our hardware wallet. Alternatively, we can install Smart PGP and then pair that with something like Open Keychain. so that we can then cryptographically verify that this card is the one that we think it should be without having to enter a pin or anything like that. Never mind all the other good stuff you can do with PGP. These apps are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of other things that you can do with your Java card. You can also use this same functionality to do things like installing both the Sato chip app and the Seakeeper applet on a single card, though you probably don't want to actually do that from a security perspective. And you can also do things like you know change the application IDs so that you've got you know hidden applets on the cards themselves. You can go as far down that rabbit hole of plausible deniability as you like uh, with these cards. And all this is before you consider doing other silly stuff just to make it look a bit less conspicuous. So there you go. That's everything you need to know to be able to create your own DIY hardware wallet running SATA chip. Despite the fact that SATA chip have been around for several years, you know, it still seems to me to be something that is relatively unknown. Though hopefully things like native support being added into Sparrow Wallet and their mobile app coming out early next year will help to, you know, draw some more attention to this project and this product. Because I think it has an important part to play in the broad ecosystem of DIY hardware wallets. If you are someone who wants to give SATA chip a go, my suggestion is that the SATA chip is best paired with the Seedkeeper product. So so basically you're going to want two cards for that, one with for SATA chip and the other for Seedkeeper because uh, that allows you to securely initialize and create backups for the device rather than having to initialize it you know, on a hot device. I'll talk about that more when I look at the retail products. In terms of support for both the retail and DIY offerings, the SATA chip team are actually really active on their official Telegram group and that's the place to go if you're having any issues trying to uh, run this device either DIY, retail or if you just have any general questions about it. Other than that, if you have any questions about SATA chip, any of the applets or processes that I covered in this video, just leave a reply in the comments. I do my best to answer all of them. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.